guys today and uh, looking forward to this session. Uh, again, I didn't bring a PowerPoint. I probably should have made some copies of my talk and you wouldn't have had to write so much. I would encourage you. I hope you have something to write with. If you have a pen and a piece of paper, it may, you know, help you just to jot a few things down. Or, yeah, borrow an envelope or whatever, right in the back of your buddy's shirt, see if he'll give it to you after the session or whatever. But um, I want to talk to you, you know, Jamie asked me to talk about not letting our relationships sink. So I, I just want to have a talk with you. Uh, I'm not going to preach. We're just going to have a conversation. And I'm going to talk to you like I would uh, a couple in my church. And I want to talk to you. How many of you in the room are married? Raise your hand if you're married. Okay. Um, been married a couple times, okay. Well, then get a bigger piece of paper or whatever, but I'm just kidding. Uh, and we got some young guys in here that aren't married, but you know, you, you can learn some things too because you can uh, figure some of this stuff out early. But uh, he wanted me to talk to you about not letting your relationships sink, and I'm going to say this to you. Um, if you're married, other than your relationship with Jesus Christ, there's no more important relationship than you and your wife. And if if the day we don't have that, we're in trouble. Our ministry's over, our men's ministry is over. And I, I just want to talk to you about not letting your marriage relationship sink. And so I'm just going to give you, I just, I just, on a piece of notebook paper, I just jotted down some things. I've been counseling couples for 25 years at GT. And um, as we get started here, I'll probably cut the session a little bit short because I got us a little behind schedule, but... Um, you know, I got to admit, you know, couples come into the church and I've been there a while and I have to be careful. I have to be careful that I don't get um, kind of sarcastic because I will have spent maybe an hour with a couple just before a young couple walks in and they're telling me, man, we're done. It's over. Because every relationship starts out ideal. Remember that? Remember the first date? I mean, we are on our best behavior, you know, nothing's bad going to happen. We're just, it's ideal, man. Mr. and Mrs. Wonderful, she's wonderful. We don't, and then, you know, we're married for a while and then you go into a different stage and, you know, the, the, the ideal stage is kind of the romance stage. It's wonderful. And very quickly after marriage, you move into the reality stage. And now no longer is everything ideal. It seems like everything is an ordeal. And then the third phase that we try to move into with our relationships is security stage, where we just know that we know. Is it perfect? No. Am I ever going to become an introvert? No. Is my wife ever going to become an extrovert? No. Are we going to always agree on everything we ever talk about? No. But are we ever going to end this relationship? No. We're secure. Because we move really quickly from everything being ideal to everything being an ordeal to I'm ready for a new deal. And what I want to talk to you about today is how to manage that conflict, because we all have it. We all have stuff. And um, so let's have a word of prayer, and then uh, we'll just dive in with some of these principles. Lord, I thank you for these men. And I thank you, Lord, for the women that are a part of their lives and aren't here, but they're at home. They're doing something today. And Lord, I don't know where each man in this room's marriage is, if it's in the ideal or or the ordeal stage, or even someone that's considering ending their marriage. But I pray, God, that some of the things that we talk about today would just encourage these men in their marriage and in their relationship. And I just thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Two weeks ago, I spoke at a marriage retreat, and uh, it was for a church out of New York City, and we were meeting down in Valley Forge, and it was a blast. Uh, and, you know, so my wife was there, and the men and wives were there. Now, you say, well, man, today, like, our wives aren't here. You're going to say this stuff, and they're not going to hear it. You know, sometimes in counseling, um, before I meet with the couple, I'll meet with them individually. And there's some things we can talk about today in a little different way because our wives aren't here. Not in a negative, not that we're trying to keep something from them. But I'm telling you, there'll be some things we talk about today that if you jot them down and you pray about it and you go home, I guarantee you, without saying a word, you wait a couple weeks, I guarantee your wife's going to notice it. She may even say something to you about it. But I was in this marriage retreat last week, and it was these guys, I don't know, just from New York. They were straight shooters. They were just, it was amazing. We were having a blast. And, you know, the pastor distinctly made a decision. He said, hey, we're always worshiping the church, whatever. He goes, we want to spend time in the Word. We want to spend time in prayer. But uh, we're going to do some icebreakers. So they played the newlywed game. 
and they had these couples up there in the newlywed game, and they're going down, and so you know how that game works. I think most of us are old enough to remember. The women go out, and they ask the men questions, and the women come in, and they compare answers. And so they asked the men, what was your fav what will your wife say was her favorite vacation? And they're going down through and they're naming the places. And this guy on the end, I think his name was CJ, he said, oh man, it was our, it was our trip to Jamaica. That's what she's going to say. So the wives come back in and uh, they're going down through and they're saying, you know, Florida, oh, we went to Canada, oh, our cruise in the, and then they get down to CJ and, and his wife says, um, our, my favorite uh, vacation was when we went to Mexico and he goes no and he lifts up the sign and it says Jamaica she goes, Jamaica we've never been to Jamaica who'd you go to Jamaica with you know and it got a little testy right there on the set I think whoop this is when the newlywed game goes bad <laughs> <laughs> but I mean they were laughing and having a blast and uh, and so I just want to share some principles with you we're gonna talk maybe about a half hour we'll wrap up here around 1130 but let me let me give you these number one how to keep your marriage from sinking number one sincerely commit your life to Jesus Christ. Now, you don't have to write all that down, but just write something that'll cause you to remember that. And you know, it's amazing how many marriage talks I hear, how many marriage messages I hear, and this is never addressed. Jamie said it last night when he opened this whole weekend. He said, guys, we gotta get the eye of the tiger back. We gotta get zealous again. We gotta repent. We gotta get serious about our relationship with God because here's what I've learned. This relationship with this woman who's the complete opposite sex, thinks different, feels different, you know, she is never, I am never going to have the right relationship with my wife if my relationship with God isn't right. Okay? My wife is glad to be number two in my life. I'm number two in her life. Because if, if I hear guys say at my church all the time, oh, my family, man, my family's number one. They're the, they're the most important thing to me. And I say, well, then I feel sorry for you. Because then that's an idol. Because your family can't be number one. If you try to make your family number one, it'll be a mess. We need to make Jesus number one. And then our family will take the proper place. And so I don't want to underestimate. Second Peter 1.3, here's a verse for you. It says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory. Uh, you know, God... Um, has given us everything that pertains to life, to godliness, to marriage, to purity. He's given it to us. It's right here. It's in the Bible. And, it, and so I want to emphasize the number one thing you can do to help your marriage, get as close to Jesus as you can. Be in the Word. Be in prayer. Be a man of God. It's so comforting for me to know that my wife is a woman that's in the Word. Now, she has her time at night. I have my time in the morning. I'm a morning person. I get up early, I got my coffee, I do whatever, I, I'm in the Word. And man, when 9.30 rolls around, I'm dead, I'm fried. You know, Jamie said he's a 2 o'clock in the morning guy. 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in a coma by that time, man. But you got to find that rhythm in life, and you got to spend time with Jesus. One of the things I talk about in the follow book is um, Donald Trump makes a lot more money than anybody in this room probably. Okay? And all of us in this room make a different income. All of us in this room have different energy. We have different strength. We got all kinds of differences. But you know the one thing we all have in common? This week we have 168 hours. That's it. You got 168, I have 168. And how we invest those hours is really important, okay? Um, really, really important. And so um, let's commit our lives to Jesus. Number two. Uh, and I think this goes without saying, commit marriage, uh, consider marriage a lifelong commitment just as Christ is eternally committed to his bride, the church. Now, I know it can be painful to think about that. And uh, there's certainly guys in here that have been divorced. We have guys in our church, gals. It, you know, it happens. It's unfortunate. And God can redeem that. Uh, it's not the unforgivable sin. God can help us. But, you know, uh, so I'm always trying to walk that tender balance in my church, knowing that there are people that have gone through the, the heartache of divorce. But I'm also trying to always encourage the young guys, the guys sitting here today that aren't married, to say, man, you know, again, remember what I said in the message, uh, the first deal is the best deal. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19, he says to them when they were asking him about divorce and could we do it, and you know, I always have people coming to my church asking me, can, what do you think, Pastor? Well, can I leave my husband? Do you think I have grounds? Could I be remarry? And I, I've never encouraged anyone in my church to divorce. I encourage them to really seek the Lord. There are times when people are being abused and hurt. I mean, you, you know the stories. I mean, abuse and drugs and, uh, I, you know, I don't ever want a woman in an unsafe place. You may need to get out of there for a while. But here's what Jesus said. He said, haven't you read? He replied that at the beginning 
uh, the Creator made them male and female. How many know that still works for today? It doesn't matter what the state of Pennsylvania says. It doesn't matter if 26 states in the Union say a man can marry a man. God said in the beginning it was one man, one woman, and he said it was for life. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. One flesh. Think about that. And, that, and I'll just say that that's what's so, there's a mystical union. That's why when guys get wrapped up in porn and they get wrapped up in with strippers and hookers and all this, you're breaking that union. You're becoming one. The sexual union is a powerful union. And, it's, and, and you become one flesh. Like the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. You know, three distinct personalities, but one in the triune God. That's how husband and wife are. He said, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. So one of the things I tell couples, so they come in all bouncy. Oh, we love each other. Oh, we want to get married. Oh, January 22nd, you got your calendar clear? I'm like, we got a lot to talk about before January 22nd. And, I, and that's where I have to be careful because, I've, you know, I've been at this 25 years. So first thing I ask them is say, Do, have you had a good fight yet? Oh, no, we haven't fought yet. Okay, well, go back and get, get out of here then. Go leave. Keep your relationship going. Have a good fight. Come and talk to me after he's not Mr. Wonderful. You know why? Because, you know, when they first get married, it's like, then they come into my office five years later, and they're like, oh, my goodness. I hate this guy. You know? Well, well, why did you like him to begin with? Well, well, he was so laid back. He was just so easygoing. Now you know what they say five years later? He's lazy. He's not a leader. Guy can't even figure out his own sock drawer. And then I asked the guy, well, what did you like about her? Well, she's such a go-getter. She has so much energy. She just go, 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 go. What about now? She's a stinking nag now. <laughs> Isn't it amazing the things that we love about each other five years later are the things we want to break off of each other? Now, I tell, I tell couples, listen, you, you don't want to be identical. All this you know, e-harmony and you want to find compatibility. Compatibility is great. But if you were completely compatible, you wouldn't need each other. Isn't it amazing? So, you know, why does God always put people together that are different? Why is that? Because then when your differences can kind of fit inside each other and you become one flesh. If Lynn and I are both extroverts, if we're both, you know, type A, you know, if, if I'm always the one, you know, and if we're the same, we kind of, I had a guy come into my, my office one time with his wife. They're coming for marriage counseling. I don't even know if the guy was a Christian. He, told, he called me on the phone and said, we're going to meet, I got to meet to talk to you about my wife. He goes, you know, it's just unbelievable. He said, my wife, just unreal. I, 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 he said, you have no idea, Pastor. Well, yeah, I probably do. She's, she's just terrible. You know, I said, and I said to him, I said, well, what is it? He just listed a bunch of things. I said, and you married her with all this stuff? Why'd you ever marry her? He goes, well, she wasn't like that when I married her. I said, you made her that way? You didn't know what to do with that, you know? So they come in, and he said, this is the first words out of his mouth. Now, you imagine. So I'm, I'm you know, you, you listen to what people say, and you listen to what they don't say in their body language. He walks into my office. He sits down. He goes, okay, pastor. I mean, he didn't wait for me to, I, I'm the pastor, okay? It's my office. Can I greet everybody? Maybe we'll open in prayer. No, he just jumps right in like a bull. He's like, okay, pastor, first words. I'm like, hey, how are you doing? How, how was your week? You know, boom. It's this level right away. And this is what he says to me. He goes, tell her who wears the pants in the family. I am not, I'm not making this up. You can't make this stuff up. Tell her who wears the pants in the family. My wife wears pants. Uh, does your wife wear pants? And I could tell right off the bat, you know what? This guy's killing his marriage. So I said, okay, I'll tell you who wears the pants in the family. Are you ready? And he's like, looking at her like, wait. I said, Jesus wears the pants in your family. And, well, he didn't like that. He thought for sure I was going to say, yeah, you wear the pants in the family, you know. Um, so I tell couples that marriage, you know, it's not about feelings. Feelings are, they're great, they're wonderful, but they're bad leaders. Feelings make bad soil for a relationship. I'm going to tell you right now, have you ever woke up and felt like you didn't love your wife? Go ahead, safe place. I don't think it's on video. I'm sure our wives have woke up and don't feel like they love us. 
man, if, if divorce could be instant, and it just about is today, but if, it, you know, um, we, we'd all be divorced because our feelings sometimes say, I'm sick of this. I didn't sign up for this. But feelings aren't the soil of our relationship. Commitment is. All right? Number three. Um, agree to always listen to each other's feelings even if you disagree with the feeling. Now, you need to write that one down as a man. Because these first two, Jesus, yeah, commitment, I get it. But this one we don't get at all. Agree to always listen to each other's feelings even if you disagree with the appropriateness of those feelings. Most men, not all, and I want to be stereotypical, because I have three boys and one of my sons is a big feeler. Two of them aren't. But most men typically aren't big feeling guys. We're not in touch with our feelings. But again, that doesn't mean you're any less of a man if you are. And there's some women I've met that, I don't know, their feeling button's broke too. So I don't want to be stereotypical, but a lot of times men want to approach our relationship, and this is why they sink. We want to approach our relationship the way we approach our work. Now, last night, Bobby was saying that he's handy. How many of you guys are handy? You like tools? Yeah. Well, I'm not handy. I like to eat. That's what I like to do. Amen. And my buddy Al, that's why we travel together. Well, I'm not handy. I got, my toolbox says Fisher-Price. I don't know if that's good or bad. Is that good? <laughs> Craftsman, Fisher-Price. I can't fix, you know, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. I can't fix anything. I mean, I'm, I've got a strong back. I do mow the grass, you know, maybe a power washer. That's about the most power I get. But, um, and so when it comes to our relationships, we want to get the toolbox out. Our wife is trying to share her feelings, and, it's, and we're not even letting her get it out of her mouth. We're wanting to fix it. And we, we show this video in our church. I should have probably brought it. I feel bad. I, I should have brought some more video support. I know that's important. But there's this video, and there's a gal, and she's talking, and you only see her for a little bit. And uh, she's going, I don't know what it is. It's just, just this pain, you know, right? It's just right here. I, I can't. I don't know what it is. I just feel like. And then the camera pans back, and she's got a nail in the middle of her forehead, literally a nail. And her husband says, I, I, think, it's, I think it's because there's a nail in your forehead. And she's like, don't go there. Can't I just share my feelings? It's not the nail. And they go back and forth, and it's just hilarious because that's sometimes how, you know, sometimes to us, the problem in our relationship is painfully obvious. If my wife would just let me fix it, Men see relationships like a toolbox. Women see relationships like a river. It all connects. I can't remember what happened yesterday, honestly. I have a really short memory. I don't hold grudges. I'm like, man, okay, whatever. You know, my dad was a lot like that. My dad would spank us and discipline us, and then the next minute, it was over. My mom was a little bit more like if you got in trouble with her, you know, it'd be a little silence, you know, and again, I just, so my wife and I tend to run like that, like, you know, if we have a problem, I, I remember we're, you know, we would drive home and maybe I said something that I shouldn't have said or whatever, and my wife gets real quiet. Any of your wives get quiet? And you're like, oh man, I feel like the temperature's changing. Maybe we should flip on the radio, you know, and I'll say, what's wrong, honey? And she'll say, nothing. How many know, there, there, like there's, when a, when a wife says, nothing real fast like that, that means there's something wrong. But I don't want to, here's what it means. Here's like, interpret it for men. There's something wrong, but I don't want to tell you right now. Now see, I should learn, that's, that's her feeling. Like for me, if I'm thinking it, I say it, it's out. I'm not going to sit there quietly and pout a little bit and then hope she asks me. I'm just going to say, hey, you know, whatever. You know, that seemed a little weird. But my wife is real quiet. Say, what's wrong? Nothing. Okay, nothing. So years ago, I, that would drive me nuts. Because the Bible says, don't let the sun go down in your wrath. So we'd get home, and I, I say, honey, you know, we drove all the way home. You didn't say a word. We were talking yesterday. It was wonderful. And now, you know, 30 minutes, it's dead silent. Hey, why don't we talk? Let's let not the sun go down in our wrath. And, and she'd be like, I just don't want to talk. I don't want to talk about it. Okay, so there is something. Yeah, there is something, but I don't want to talk about it. And one day, you know, just again, being very transparent, I got very sarcastic with Lynn, and I just said to her, it was one of these deals, you know. I don't know if I was driving. I don't know why I'm always driving when we're fighting. We're not, but it just, it works, whatever. And I said, uh, is there something wrong? No, there's nothing wrong. And then I said, okay. <laughs> well, I sense that there's something wrong. And when you feel like you're ready to talk about it, then I'll, then I'll just be ready. And I was being an idiot. I wasn't being, I was being sarcastic. And Lynn came to me about three hours later and she said, you know, I've been waiting for you to say that. She goes, and I know you said it sarcastically, but she said, if you would do that more often, it would really help me. 
And so I've learned now. I, I, in fact, I've stopped really asking my wife what's wrong. Like if I sense something's wrong, because now I'm married 25 years. When I was young, man, I didn't know what I said. Now, now you kind of know. <laughs> Isn't it amazing what you know? You're like, oh boy, shouldn't have said that. So I, I just say that, you know, let, let your wife talk. Let her share her feelings, okay? Uh, really, really, really important. Number four, uh, commit yourself to honesty and acceptance. I tell young couples that are getting married, I tell them, here are the ABCs of communication. This is really simple to remember, ABC, okay? The A stands for accept each other. What most people want to do in a relationship is they want to change the other person. Women are bad for this. Man, a young girl in our church comes in, she's going to marry this guy, and I just see red flags everywhere, you know. Uh, you know, I know he's like number three in the world with Xbox and Call of Duty, but does he have a job? I mean, no, he's awesome at Xbox. He's great at Call of Duty. Amazing. Yeah, awesome. Does he have a job? <laughs> you know, I see red flags everywhere. And, oh, she just loves him and whatever. And, and what she thinks is it's going to change. How many of you know it doesn't change? We are who we are. Now, it changes a little. God changes us. I really believe I'm a better husband 27, 28 years into marriage than I was when I first met Lynn because between the Holy Spirit and her growing and, you know, if I'm growing in God, I should be a better husband, a little more sensitive. I should be better. But at the end of the day, we are who we are. You're not going to change the major part. So A, in community, is just accept that it's not going to change. B is be a good listener. Be a good listener. Again, I'm confessing my own sin. I'm not always a good listener. You guys know I'm a preacher. I'm a talker. That's what I do with my life. I talk. And I've learned through coaching and some other skills, I've got to learn to listen, especially with my wife. I have to be, because sometimes when my wife is sharing her feelings, I'm not really listening to her. What am I doing? I'm thinking about what I'm going to say back to her about her feelings. And I even now, we, we, you know, we did it years ago, and I do it with couples. There's a little piece of linoleum, and I'll say to couples that are struggling, having communication, I'll, I'll say, take the linoleum, and when you're holding it, you have the floor. And it means the other person listens. And it's cool. I watch couples do this, and she's talking. He's going, yeah, but, but you know what? She's like, I have, the, I have the floor. Because some of us, we don't accept the person for who they really are, and we really don't listen. And then thirdly is C, ABC, choose your words carefully. Whoever said sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me, did never read the Bible. Because Proverbs 18 says, this tongue, this little slab of flesh, this little pink thing between our teeth, the Bible says it's set on fire from hell. It has the power of life and death. Guys, I want to tell you something. If you can out-talk your wife and out-argue her and get louder, you can slice her with your tongue. You kill her with your words. I mean, we talk in the church about physical abuse, and I'm going to tell you, you know what a lot of Christian women endure in their homes? Verbal abuse. And it's just as painful. In fact, bruises heal. Some cutting words that you say to your wife, I'm going to tell you, they hang on to that forever because, again, life's a river. They don't forget that. I had a lady come in my office. She remembered 23 years later what her husband said to her, a very vicious verbal attack. And it's hard to get that out of your mind. You know, we say, well, God can forgive and forget. Yeah, but, you know, I'm not God. We can forgive, but sometimes it's hard to forget. And I'll talk about that in a minute. All right. Here's another one. Determine to attempt to love each other unconditionally. Unconditional. That means not 50-50. That means 100% all the time. And I'm glad I get to talk to you guys as men. Because I put the greater weight on the man. The Bible says we're to love Christ the way we're, we're to love our wife the way Christ loved the church. Dude, that, like for me, that's the end of the, could it get any, could it get any more clear than that? And when I really stop and think about that, I mean, all this stuff goes back to the garden, you know, our, Adam and Eve. Now, Eve wasn't doing what she should have done. She's grabbing the fruit. She's talking to the devil. She's grabbing it. Here, you want to try it, honey? She's not under her husband's covering. She's not like following his lead. And what's Adam doing? He's sitting back. He's not being the leader. He's letting her do her thing. And then he just go ahead and, and he kind of, you know, co you know, cooperates. He could, he, you know, I could hear Adam saying, you know, give me the apple. Happy, happy wife, happy life. Have you ever said that, you know? I've had to make some decisions in my family. It doesn't make everybody happy. Sometimes you have to lead. 
but our wives need to really know that we love them. And, and it's got to be unconditional. I've never met a woman who won't submit to a man who says to her, I'm your slave. Because that's what Jesus was. He died. He laid down all of his power, all of his authority. He died on a cross. He died for the church. That's why the church submits to Jesus. That's why there's no other name given among men by which we must save. That's why every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. So we've got a lot to, to consider there. Uh, let me, I'm going to go to some of these that are more uh, pertinent. Number one, before you go to your wife about her problems, make sure you confess your own. You know, there's this amazing habit we have as human beings, and Jesus said it in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 3. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? And that's a principle that I always, you know, so I can see this little tiny speck. It's amazing. Isn't it amazing how we can see our wives, our wife's little issues? Man, it drives me nuts. Why does she do that? You know, and then our wives, they kind of nitpick. I, I, I guess the guy's name is Tim Grable. He, he's a comedian. He walks through and his, his, he said, my wife never just tells me what she wants. She always got to make it like a question. Like, so she walks through the bedroom and she says, Tim, are those your underwear on the ground? And he'll be like, what am I supposed to say to that? You know, he's like, I mean, if they're not my underwear, I've got a few questions of my own. You know what I mean? <laughs> I hope they're my underwear, you know? Or she'll say, Tim, are, are you going to wear those pants? We're going out. You're going to wear those pants? He says, no. He says, now I say, oh, no, 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 honey. These are my practice pants. I didn't put the real ones on yet. You know, sometimes our wives just, you know, instead of just being direct, you know, but we, we, we kind of nitpick at our wives and Jesus is saying, listen, how can we see the little stuff in our wife in her life if I've got this big hunk of lumber in my own eye? So the principle is let the Holy Spirit deal with my junk and if, you know, again, if I'm being the man that God wants me to be, there's a better chance that our wives are going to respect us. I'm telling you, if we'll do this, you just go home. Don't you say, how was the marriage conference? Oh, man, I got like 20 things on how to keep our marriage from sinking. Don't even tell her. Just start putting some of this into practice. And I'm going to tell you, about day three or four, she'll be like, wow. She'll notice, I guarantee you. All right? So confess your own sins. Um, there's power in letting the Holy Spirit deal with you. Limit your argument, because you, you're going to argue, guaranteed. You're going to argue. Limit the discussion to the topic. Man, when couples get into trouble is when they just start all over the oh, That's how you always are. You always do that. Now, is that true? No. You're just like your father. Am I just like my father? No. But we, we start exaggerating and doing all these things. Um, we got to eliminate those phrases, never, always, you know, um, you say, well, I can't do that. You better say, I, you know, I won't do that because I can do anything I want to do. Um, and this is really important. I, I think what happens in a lot of Christian families, why our relationships sink, is because we don't do the basics. Jesus said we should forgive. Now, if you and your wife have been fighting for two or three days and there's been limited conversation, there's been some, you know, some jabs and where it's kind of quiet and you make your own dinner and we're going our own way, and then, you know, eventually we kind of get back and it, I don't know how you make up, but we've tried to let sex fix everything. Let's just hop in the sack and fix it that way. And then we just, it just is like a scab. We need to really repent and we need to really forgive. And I know just, you know, not too long ago, Lynn and I had a little whatever spat and I came to her and I confessed. I said, honey, I said, you're absolutely right. I said, I was wrong. I'm sorry. I want you to forgive me. I reacted the wrong way. It's not how I should react as a Christian. And, uh, and Lynn said to me, it's okay. It doesn't matter. And then I had to stop her and say, well, you know, we had a fuss for a little while over that. It does matter. I'm, I'm, asking, I'm asking you to forgive me. Do you forgive me? And she said, you know, I forgive you. That's the right way to end it. Because if we just kind of go through, then it's like a scab that get heals, but then it gets ripped back open. And that's why, that's why couples never get out of this conflict, because they never really deal with it. It just kind of keeps going. You know, some couples struggle in finances. Sometimes intimacy is a big fight. Sometimes it's the kids. There's, there's things that couples tend to fight over. Like, Lynn and I, we don't fight over money. We don't fuss over money. I mean, she has a checkbook. I trust her completely. We talk about our investments. We, I never worry Lynn's going to go spend and go crazy. You know, there's, there's certain things where you, you have strengths and growth there, and then there's areas where you need to grow. 
and, uh, and when you have a difficulty, a conflict, then you need to resolve it, all right? A couple more, we're going to try to wrap up early, especially in here, because uh, we'll have the transition then for the second session. Um, let's see. Focus on the issue. Don't attack each other. I mean, you love this gal. You married her. Don't attack her. Don't hurt her. Uh, you're bigger. You're stronger. You, you, you can just, we can, you know, the Bible calls the wife the weaker vessel. I know in this politically correct society we live in, no one wants to say stuff like that, but the Bible says it. And so we have to lead with gentleness and kindness and patience. Um, I, I said earlier, sometimes we need to let our wives think about it. You know, depending how your wife is, honor her. Don't try to you know, pin her down for an answer, okay? Um, here's, a, here's another one. Um, even though your mate won't always be correct, consider your wife an instrument of God for working in your life. I, you know, I used to kid like, well, if the Holy Spirit doesn't tell me, Lynn will. But our wives do have some insight. How many believe your wife has some good insight? And sometimes what keeps us from taking that is our pride. Because we want to win. We don't want to be wrong. But I'll tell you, again, if we'll just humble ourselves, you know, a lot of our wives don't want to tell us stuff because they're afraid. They're afraid how we'll react. And the way that we can bring our wife in as a friend is to say, listen, you know, you can tell me anything you want. I, I don't know that we'll always agree. I may have a different feeling, and that's okay. But I'm going to listen to what you have to say. I'm going to consider it. And I believe, you know, the Bible says if you find a, a good wife, you find a good thing. You find favor from the Lord. And so I think it's important that we that we, you know, what, what, what do men want most in a relationship? What do you want, mo what do you think most men want in a relationship? Companionship? Respect. They want to be respected. And when our wives offer opinions to us and they're, we think they're disrespecting us, like what, don't you think I, I mean, what do our wives want most? They want love. They want to know that this big hunk of a guy loves me. And, and so that cycle can sometimes, a great book if you want to read one, Love and Respect, an amazing book. Okay? Um, let's see. A couple more and we'll wrap up. It's about 11.30. Uh, what's that? Love and Respect. Um, oh, I can't think of his name. Jamie, you know who wrote Love and Respect? We can Google it and find it. It's, it'll be all over the internet when you type it in. There's workbooks. Uh, if you don't, you know, if you don't like the book, it's a great DVD set. In fact, I personally, Lynn and I watch the DVDs. The DVDs are funnier and more easier to follow. A lot of guys, I don't know, I'm not, you know, again, stereotypical. A lot of guys don't like to read necessarily. And, and so Lynn and I sat down in our den. We popped them in. We watched. We laughed our heads off. And we, it was like so true. It's like he talks about, you know, men here blue, women here pink. And um, it's not wrong. It's just different. Uh, but I'll try to get you the name. I can't think of the name of the author. It's amazing. It's a... Uh, Jamie's Googling it right now, so we'll have it. Yeah, there it is. I think it's up on the screen, or it's going to go up on the screen. Uh, Emerson Engerich, Dr. Emerson, double E there. Um, let's, let's go with one more here. Uh, and I think this will be a good one to close on. Remember that the resolution of the conflict is most important. Don't, you know, don't, don't let things go on for days and days and fuss and fight. You know, again, be the leader in your home. You know, do what it takes to kind of lower that conflict. And one of the things that we can do, you know, when my kids were little, I remember when the kids were little, I'd be in church, and the people in church would say, oh, Pastor Brian, man, these years are going to go by so fast. You're not going to believe it. And I used to say, it ain't going by fast for me, man. This seems like it's a long time. And Lynn and I didn't get to do a lot of date nights. We were busy with the church, busy with our kids. We probably didn't take enough time especially early on. And now, man, we get all kinds of date nights. I mean, we're almost near the empty nest. We're launching our kids. We're on that motorcycle. She loves to ride. We take rides together. We talk. We have date nights all the time. It's amazing. But I would, you're all at a different season, but I would encourage you, set a time to talk with your wife. A lot of times, and you could initiate this. And again, a lot of times, I'm, not, I'm just being honest. Don't get mad. Don't throw something at me. But we don't take the initiative in our relationship. Our wives take the spiritual initiative. When's the last time you ask your wife to read a book with you? I look at some of the guys in my church. They play softball two nights a week. They're in this men's group. They're in that men's group. And no, no offense, Jamie, but I tell some of our guys, you need to get out of the men's group. You need to get in a marriage class. You hang with the men too much. You're married to that woman. 
You can do this, you do that. You need to be in something where you're with her and share ministry with her together. Or you say to her, I found this great book, maybe we could read it together. And, and, and we weren't the ones that, you know, I didn't have like family devotion every night with my family. I wasn't, you know, I didn't build some family altar where I unpacked the truths of God's word for two hours every night. But I'll tell you something we did have in our house. Every Monday night was our Cuck family meeting. We never made a major decision outside of that meeting for our family. My boys were always a part of that. They played sports like I did, so we're eating at different times. We're running. I mean, it's crazy. You know, if you think about it, we're eating in the car. We're getting food shoved out of a window into our car. I mean, just we're eating just, just the way God designed it, right, in the drive through It's awesome because the next day when you're really busy, you just reach down the crack of the seat, get a French fry from yesterday, you're good. You know, it's sick, isn't it, how we eat? I've eaten entire pizzas in my pickup truck with my kids at a soccer practice. We need to have a time where we sit and say, honey, why don't we go on a date night? Why don't we go out to dinner and just talk about us? I'm, I'm telling you, don't do that like, don't do that when you walk in the driveway today. She'll be like, okay, you've been to the men's retreat, great, well, we'll do it. <laughs> Wait till like next Thursday. I just say, I was thinking, wouldn't it be nice if we just got out and had, had a talk? Okay, any, any thoughts, any questions? Anybody got a comment? Take a couple before we close in prayer. And again, we'll kind of clear out, get ready to, when's the next session gonna start, Jamie? Yeah, so I'll give you time to get break, eat another donut. Some of you are on like your sixth donut. Isn't it awesome in a men's conference? You like half a dozen donuts. But any questions, any comments? Anybody got something they want to say? Yeah. Powerful. Write that one down. Be grateful. You know, we always think the grass is greener on the other side. I got news for you. You still got to mow it. You just look around. God's blessed you with a good wife. Why don't we take a minute right now and just pray for our wives and do exactly what you said, brother. What's your name? Glenn. 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 Lord, we just, uh, we thank you today. We don't want our relationship to sink with our wife Jesus, we thank you for your grace in our life, and we thank you for our brides, for our wives, our, our, the women in our lives, Lord. And, I, and we take a minute right now, God, whatever they're doing right now at home, maybe with a girlfriend, whatever they're doing, God, probably doing something at home for us. We just pray that you'll bless them today. We, we, we say today, God, we are grateful for our wives. We're grateful for the blessing that they are. And even, Lord, if we've had a different opinion, I, pr I pray for men right now that maybe are going through a struggle with their spouse. And I pray, God, that you'll just cause them to kind of take a step, to step out of the boat and walk toward them. And, and God, I pray that you would just bring healing and strength and love and respect and gratitude and forgiveness, acceptance, God, whatever. Help us to be better listeners. Help us, Lord, even when we do have to say something, to choose our words carefully and the way we say it and, and to honor our wives, God, as the weaker vessel, but a vessel that you've created. And God, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.